So we're continuing our series, Putting the Amazing Back in Grace, which is really just uh, a study on what's called TULIP, or the Doctrines of Grace. And I don't really like that acronym TULIP all that much. We talked about that. And some of you asked me about some of the other ones that are out there. There's one called Roses, and there's one called Bacon. And you know, they don't seem to do it for me either. In fact, I came up with my own. It's called RISDEP. And so now I've completely wilted our beautiful tulip. Um, but I really like this wording better, where instead of total depravity, it's radical depravity. Because total makes it sound like there's nothing, you know, virtuous in humans at all. It's um, radical depravity is probably better. And instead of unconditional election, sovereign election. God is in control of everything, including salvation. As Jonah says, salvation is from the Lord. And then instead of unlimited or uh, 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 limited atonement, it's definite atonement. Moment. God, Christ died for his sheep. And then today we get to the I, which the I stands for irresistible grace. I like the way that sounds. I, everybody likes something that's irresistible. Um, but it also makes it sound like we can't exercise our own wills and resist God's grace. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, so we're continuing this. And so what is irresistible grace that we're going to look at this morning? Um, well, it's about two things. One, it's about grace. And every, everybody here should know what grace is. A good definition of grace, I've heard, is God's riches at Christ's expense, an acronym. It's God's unmerited favor. And here, specifically, in these doctrines of grace, we're talking about God's grace in salvation. Right? Reformed theology is much, much broader than just tulip. Tulip's a little tiny slice, but it's an important slice because it's about God's grace in salvation. The doctrines of grace and salvation. God's unmerited gift. Peter preached on it this morning. We can't earn our salvation. It's God's, it's Christ's work on our behalf. And so uh, another term for irresistible grace that's often used in theology is called effectual calling. Another big term, what does it mean? Well, there's two types of call we read about in the gospel. One is the outward call, or the gospel call. This is the preaching of the gospel to all creation. You know, Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we preach the gospel to everybody without favor, right? All creation should hear the gospel. And we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, put your faith and trust in him, and you shall be saved. And that's the message. And it's a call that should go out to all the world. But there's another call theologians talk about, which is called the effectual call. And that answers the question, why do some people say yes to the gospel, while other people say no to the gospel? And the effectual call, or irresistible grace, is not just God's grace that goes out to all people in terms of inviting them to come to him, to come into the kingdom, but it's effective in bringing God's chosen people into the kingdom. God's grace works in our hearts, works in our lives to bring us to faith in a way that the term irresistible implies. So what I want to do is talk about, does that mean that God drags us kicking and screaming into his kingdom? Like a toddler in the grocery store, you're dragging him along? Is that, is that how God's grace works? I've, I heard one uh, theologian say, I can't accept this doctrine because it implies that some people who don't want to come into God's kingdom are brought in kicking and screaming, and others who want to desperately get in are left out because of election. And, and, and that's a caricature. It's not really true. So let's, let's talk about more deeply, what, is this, what does this doctrine really teach? And if we think about the doctrines of grace, the Tulip, the five doctrines of grace we're talking about, they're all tied together, right? So we started with total depravity or total 
inability, meaning that we, we, there's nothing in us we can do to make ourselves right with God. In Adam's fall, sinned we all, like the old original sin, like the old New, uh, New England primer used to teach. Um, so there's nothing we can do. We are sinners by birth and by choice. And then unconditional election teaches that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1. And then definite atonement or limited atonement means that God, Christ died for his sheep, for his sheep. And then ir irresistible grace is tied in. Grace has to be irresistible because it, unless God does something for us, we'll never put our faith and trust in Christ. We'll talk about why that is, um, but it's closely tied um, and to election as well. Uh, effectual calling or effectual grace teaches that God makes certain that those he has chosen will come to faith. That's what it means. It's effective. It's effectual. Um, it's irresistible to them. But why is it irresistible? Again, is it because uh, he drags us kicking and screaming in against our will? No, that's not how it works. So let's, let's talk about it. Um, the, if we think about total depravity, our condition apart from Christ, um, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. We can do nothing to make ourselves right with God. And so we need help. And I like the illustration of the hog. Okay, there's something that is irresistible to a hog. What is that? Rolling in the muck in the mire. He loves it. It's irresistible. Well, why is that? It's because it's in the nature of a hog. You take a lamb. Does a lamb go and roll in the muck in the mire? No, because it's not part of the lamb's nature. How many of you have heard a coyote's howl sometime in the evening? That haunting coyote howl that, you know, scares the daylights out of you. Well, when you go out in your backyard and you see a bunny rabbit, you don't expect it to howl like a coyote, right? Why not? Because it's not in its nature. And so what total depravity teaches is, is um, our, our nature is fallen. And so with a fallen nature, we can't come to Christ. We won't believe in Christ unless God does something in our hearts. He's got to give us a new nature. And that's really what irresistible grace is all about. It's about the new birth. It's about Christ giving us a new nature. So there's this general call that goes out to all people, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You know, exercise your will, believe on Jesus and you will be saved. Put your faith in him. But only some respond. And those are the ones scripture teaches and Jesus taught that, that, that God's spirit does something in their hearts. He doesn't overpower their will. He doesn't drag and kick them kicking and screaming against their will, but he changes their heart. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born from above. Literally, the Greek there, the word, uh, the Greek word can be translated born again or born from above. It's a, it's a play on words. Born from above means born of the Holy Spirit, right? And so, so God changes our hearts so that we, our eyes are suddenly open to the beauty and the glory of the cross, of Christ, of the gospel. And so that's a work, that's a factual grace. It's a work of God's spirit that has to happen in our hearts for us to, 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 to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Look at the Apostle Paul. You could argue that God dragged him kicking and screaming into his kingdom, right? Because Paul is on his way to Damascus to kill Christians. And, you know, ray of light, he's thrown to the ground. And Jesus says, I've got something I want you to do. And Paul says, yes, sir. So what's going on there? Did God drag him kicking and screaming at that moment? Well, in a sense, since he like did a 180 immediately in his conversion. But actually, his, his, he was changed on the inside, right? God's spirit opened his eyes to who Jesus really was. And that's why Paul 
was converted. And that's what irresistible grace is. That's what uh, effectual grace is. And if you think about your own life, if I think about my life, how God's been gracious to us, we think about it. Yeah, I made a decision. I did. When I was six years old, I said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And it was my decision. But as I dig into scripture, I find out that God's spirit granted me that gift of faith. That's exactly what, uh, what, what scripture says in a number of places. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. And he says, another, another place in John chapter six, no one can come to me unless the father has enabled him. And this is in the context of the bread of life discourse. Jesus is talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and people are leaving in droves. They're like, nah, it's too much for me. And, and in, in that context, and, and he says to his disciples, are you going to leave too? And they say, no, Lord, we won't leave. You have the words of eternal life. And it's in that context he, said, he says, no one can come to me unless it is given to him of the Father. And that, my friends, is irresistible grace. God does for you, believer, something that he doesn't do for everybody. He grants you the gift of faith, the gift of grace. Um, so what does that mean for evangelism? This is exciting news for those of you who love evangelism, right? Because it means that when we go fishing for people, we know there's a catch out there. Because God has people all over from every tribe and, and, and tongue and culture and nation that he's bringing into his kingdom, right? And so there are people out there just waiting for God's Spirit to open their eyes, but they have to hear the gospel first. That's how God works. And, and so evangelism becomes that much more important. I want to close by uh, just reading from the Council of Orange. This is a thousand years before John Calvin. So don't think this all started with John Calvin and, and Calvinism and Reformed theology. This goes back to the apostles and, uh, and Augustine, and then this Council of Orange, let me just read the first one. I'm not going to read all of these, but um, the first bullet here in this council talked about this very issue. Um, if anyone says that the grace of God can be conferred as a result of human prayer, um, but that it is not grace itself which makes us pray to God, he contradicts the prophet Isaiah or the apostle who says the same thing. I was found by them that did not seek me. Friends, we're not the seekers. God is the seeker. He's got his arrows drawn. He's got his sights set on believers. And our job is to share the gospel because we don't know who those people are that God's going to bring into his kingdom. But they need to hear the gospel in order to become part of his kingdom. So that is what irresistible grace is. We're going to bring up a panel here in a moment that's going to uh, talk about it and talk about their experience with it. And then we'll take some questions. So I'm going to give you about a three minute break here while we get ready for the panel to come up.